today, the USGA and the RNA announced the first update to the World Handicap System as part of an ongoing review of the rules of handicapping and course rating system. The latest revisions will go into effect beginning January 2024. And here are some of the key updates. Inclusion of shorter length golf courses within the course rating system as short as 1,500 yards for 18 holes or 750 yards for nine holes, use of an expected score for a hole not played. Nine hole scores will be considered in the calculation of a player's handicap index immediately. Playing conditions calculation adjustments <coughs> made for more frequent and enhanced guidance on conducting a handicap review. Thomas Pagel, Chief Governance Officer with the USGA, joins us now. Thomas, we appreciate the time. Why is this update happening in 2024? Were you hearing from some players? Was it the advent of shorter courses? What's the reason behind it? Yeah, first of all, thanks thanks for having me today and uh, going over these changes. Look, you reflect back on 2020 when with our partners at the RNA, we released the World Handicap System. So prior to that, you had six different handicap authorities across the globe, six different systems. And we really brought the world together, you know, this increasingly borderless world, so that now handicaps can translate and travel with you when you go play in other parts of the world. And when we launched that, we knew that we weren't done. We knew that there were improvements yet to be made. And for 2024, we're excited to really launch uh, version 2.0 of WHS, right? It, it is a natural evolution. As we look at, you know, the short courses there, those par three courses, nine hole courses, obviously becoming increasingly popular. So we wanted to make sure that as golfers embrace and enjoy these different formats, these different styles of golf courses, that they're able to include those within their handicap. And, you know, you often think of resorts that are opening these shorter courses like the Cradle at Pinehurst, but you also think about golf and inclusion and engaging different communities. And as golf becomes closer to urban city centers, maybe played on smaller footprints, uh, those scores and those players will, will be playing under the rules of golf and they'll be able to post scores to their handicap or even golf courses that put in shorter tees for families to enjoy. So we're really excited about continuing the theme of inclusivity, of engagement, of having a modern system that really reflects how people are playing the game today and how they want to play the game. How will a typical recreational golfer, someone who's been around the game for a while, who already has a handicap, where are they going to see the impact of this, Thomas, versus somebody who's just getting into the game now, who perhaps doesn't actually yet have a handicap and wants to work towards that. It's got to be two very different interfaces with this new handicap system, right? Yeah, I mean, those that have an existing handicap, we went through change in 2020, albeit here in the U.S. it was relatively small. I, Eamon, I think the number one thing golfers are going to start to see uh, in 2024 is how we treat nine-hole scores, right? Currently, uh, you take a nine hole score, you post it, and it's going to sit in your handicap record until you play another nine holes. Um, we want the system to be more responsive. We want the system to really uh, account for, for the increased popularity of nine hole play. So starting in 2024, when you post a nine hole round, we're actually going to go ahead and provide an expected score for the second nine based on the golf course you're playing, based on your handicap index. And that's now going to count right away towards your handicap index. So again, if you think about the changes for 2020, and the next day updates or next day revisions, now those nine hole scores are gonna be included. So I would say that'll be the number one change that golfers that are used to having a handicap index are gonna are gonna notice. Just on those nine hole scores, Tom, the the number of golfers who have a handicap already, who filed nine hole scores last year, it was 27% of scores filed by women. It was half of that for men. But for golfers with a newly established handicap, say within the last 12 months, those numbers are 45% for women. 21% for men. What does that tell you about the audience that is coming into this game and starting to establish a handicap? It doesn't suggest that it's the old audience that's out there grinding on 18-hole rounds over the course of five or six hours. Yeah, Eamon, first of all, it tells me two things. One, if you look here in the U.S., we have about 3.2 million golfers currently with a handicap index. That's up tremendously since 2020. So we are seeing an increased engagement with the game, increased popularity, and with that, People are getting handicaps, and we're trying to make it easier than ever for a golfer to get a handicap. They can now sign up at usga.org slash WHS, join their local allied golf association, and, and be off and running. So the popularity is certainly there. And then from the nine-hole perspective, again, I think it just shows uh, how people are engaging with the game. You know, people, wh whether you have an existing handicap or you're new to the game, you know, finding that time after work or before work to go play nine-hole rounds, 
Uh, perhaps it's not as taboo as it once was. And with that, we're also seeing an increase in, in leagues that are specific to nine hole play. So people are just really excited to be outside, be outside playing the game. And if that means playing nine holes instead of 18, I think people are embracing that. And frankly, it's time for, for the WHS to, to embrace that and reflect it as well. Thomas, I've always considered a handicap index like a golfer's driver's license. Why is a handicap index important to begin with in your mind? Yeah, re really, there's there's two reasons. One, uh, the reason that the handicap system was put in place over 100 years ago, right, it's to provide an opportunity for fair and equitable play. So, Damon, when you and I step up to the first tee, we can look at our handicap index, compare ourselves against each other, and have a game where we're giving strokes or not giving strokes. So that's number one. But then, you know, something we're hearing more and more from golfers, especially as technology increases and, and these apps, the Gin app and others, have the ability to, to track stats. It's really a way to track your performance as a golfer. Um, you know, golf is very aspirational, inspirational. We all want to improve. And having a handicap shows you your performance level, shows where you are relative to other golfers, and really gives you that desire to want to, uh, want to achieve more, want, want to get better. Thomas, any concern about potential abuses? Some golfer going out to a, a short, easy course and spinning around a few times to kind of lower that handicap. Any concerns about that? Look, it, it is uh, like with the rules of golf, you know, we treat it as a game of integrity. The, the rules of handicapping have always had checks and balances. <laughs> That's why we use, you know, your lowest eight out of your 20. Uh, there are triggers in the system that actually allow or, or uh, that allow for committees. And we're trying to enhance those triggers, allow for committees to have the data or information to see if somebody's dropping too fast or increasing too fast to have uh, guardrails to protect those against. But, you know, that that's always existed. Uh, we don't see these changes increasing that. And again, we actually see a very low instance rate, especially here in the U.S., of people manipulating handicaps. Again, most people want just want that fair and equitable game, and they want to see how they perform against other golfers. The mere fact that he would ask that question, Thomas, is a red flag to all of his playing <laughs> compartments say, out there. Let, let's, watch out, let's watch out for Damon. <laughs> uh, what's next in this system, Thomas? I mean, there, there's always been this perception, rightly or wrongly, that the, the handicap system is some kind of antiquated relic that most golfers don't actually understand the, the wiring of. How mo many more steps can you take to simplify this process? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, look, it's always going to be a complex process, especially when you're... Uh, um, looking at golf courses and measuring the difficulty of certain tees on a golf course. It's always going to be complex, but what we want to do is we want to rely on the data. We have a robust data set, more than 75 million scores posted in the U.S. alone last year, where we can mine that data and really uh, confirm or verify that course ratings are accurate, that, that golfers' abilities are accurate, and so for us, you know, as we think from version 2.0 to 3.0, it's how can we rely on that data more to make sure that it's even more accurate tomorrow than it is today. So this is a work in progress. It's something we're very excited to share with the golf community. Again, one of the things the USGA has been involved with for over 100 years. But when we partnered with the RNA in 2020 to, to really have this single worldwide system that's now adopted in 125 countries, uh, it's just very exciting for us. And again, golfers are out there embracing it, using technology, uh, playing, playing the game, using their handicap index that, as that performance evaluation. So we just look forward to, to, again, further refinements in the future so we can make it better for all golfers. I use it. Speaking of accuracy, I'm a 16, but I'm a dangerous 16, <laughs> as many out are. there know. I bet you are. <laughs> Thomas, we appreciate the update. Thanks for the time. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it.